Well, Doubts Aloud listeners, we are now embarking into the year with episode 13, and it is going to be, and I could say this time and time again, this is going to be interesting and very different, but actually this really is going to be very different when we get into our main topic of an interview with someone very interesting. But before that, I just need to say that this show is just with Ed and myself today, because Ed, where is Francis? Well, uh, we're here, she's at uh, the Book of Mormon uh, stage show, uh, and can't be with right. us. That is a terrific show. I think anyone should see that show just to get a reflection on even fundamentalism itself. Um, and we've mentioned this before, haven't we, Ed, in the yeah, previous yeah. ones. And so that's terrific. So, um, yeah. okay, so we will have to sort of march on without Frances knowing that she's having a far greater time. Yeah, yeah we've, got, uh, <laughs> yeah. we've booked a slot with um, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's um, an American climate scientist and campaigner and um it's such a privilege to be able to speak to her and this is the sort of the slot we've been given and um so that's the clash right so i mean i th- this um topic topic is very interesting ed because right um uh, in one sense since we've started now in episode sort of 13 we've had at least for most of those episodes your climate end note which might to some listeners be sort of like you're talking about this about apologetics or this about god or the bible or archaeology and then boom we're talking about sort of climate change issues and it could seem a little bit disjointed but actually this forthcoming interview with Catherine actually shows where the two streams of ideas completely and utterly mixed because Mm. of the uh, attitude of Christian or theistic people towards climate change, which could be multiply varied. And um, it's going to be so interesting. I've been really looking forward to doing something so different as this interview. And you, you found Catherine, how? In the organization I'm part of the citizens climate lobby. Uh, She's been a leading light. Uh, but she is sort of broader than just that. Um, I, I think she'll talk more widely than just the policies that the, um, what we call the CCL, uh, advocating. Right. And, and I've, um, listened to already in, in uh, sort of preparation for this, uh, this interview, um, videos on that on YouTube series that she does, animated series plus, um, TED talks and there's two TED talks, I think. And, um, just to sort of prep for this engagement with the science of um climate change and tapping into the um the christian responses and views and interactions and all that with it yeah. and yeah. that's where this 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 um interview is going yeah she's great i mean she's very positive and enthusiastic uh as a christian uh and as a climate scientist and she's completely sees it that the, the, these kind of issues and clashes that andrew was talking about are um you know they do need exploring Yes, and so, well, we will hold no longer and dive straight in, and we're going to put some interesting questions to Catherine um, uh, from both the science side and both the, um, uh, I suppose, the religious uh, Christian uh, side of things towards that very same subject of climate change. Mm. And so, here we go. So, oh, Catherine, thank you and welcome. This is such a privilege to have you uh, with us. Thank you for having me. And um, I'd like to, uh, your time is short, and I'd like to get um, stuck in right away and ask you questions as a climate scientist, which is your uh, principal qualification. Yes. Uh, and so, just sort of stepping right back, um, is the two degree limit that uh, the politicians are saying they're trying to work towards is that actually acceptable in that if we did achieve that uh, it would not be too damaging to the planet Mm. the answer to that is relative because as scientists we know that every additional gigaton of carbon we produce carries with it an additional cost and so unfortunately there is no magic threshold where if we, if we are able to limit warming to 1.999 degrees, we'll be fine. But if we go to 2.0001 degrees, then everything's going to hell in a handbasket. 
the reality is it's more like smoking. There's no magic number of cigarettes you can smoke before you get lung cancer, but we do know that the more you smoke, the greater the damages. So for many people in the world today, they are already experiencing serious and even potential da potentially dangerous consequences from climate change. But the further we go towards and past two degrees, the more widespread these consequences are, not just in specific locations, but around the world, not just in the most sensitive sectors, but across the entire economy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so two degrees is going to be really pretty brutal. There are already impacts today, and we've barely reached one degree. So that's why the IPCC has spent so much time studying what a one and a half degree world would look like. Because if we don't know the difference between a one and a half versus a two degree world, why would we try to even go lower than two degrees? What they concluded, of course, is that there is a significant difference for many parts of the world and many sectors of the economy. So again, it reinforces the message that the best possible target is as low as we can go. Because for every additional, not just every additional degree, every additional mm. half degree we go higher, we know that there are additional consequences that will be paid in terms of money, in terms of our lives, in terms of our health, in terms of the well-being of human society as we know it. Wow. And, and what is roughly the kind of uh, date where we'd need to be carbon free? You know, doing, picking the, the low-hanging fruit now and then working hard and eventually being carbon free, what, what sort of date would that be? Well, I know that there's a number of numbers being tossed around, you know, a 12 year time horizon to turn this thing around, you may have heard. But the reality is, is that the faster we wean ourselves off carbon, the, the more risks we can avoid. So if we can wean ourselves off, off carbon based fuels, by the middle of this century, then we have a fighting chance of remaining below two degrees. If we could wean ourselves off sooner, we'd have a chance of possibly even reaching one and a half degrees. If we don't wean ourselves off carbon-based fuels until the end of the century, well, we might be looking at three degrees or higher at that point. So it really depends on how fast we can do it. And again, I'm sorry to, <laughs> I'm sorry to, to appear to dodge the question, but again, the answer is as fast as possible. Right, okay. And, and then one last question on the, the uh, speaking to you as a scientist. Um, you sometimes hear stories about the danger of a feedback loop where a kind of moderate warming maybe uh, encourages methane to be released at the, in the tundra near the north northern sort of climes and that then accelerates uh, global warming and it, you have something that's just uncontrollable and runs away with you mm -hmm. is that is that something that is a serious danger or kind of a massive alarmism or, or or how would you place it well as a scientist i am most concerned about what we know that we don't fully understand and those types of self-reinforcing feedbacks or really vicious cycles, I like to call them, are one of the things that we know that we don't understand enough about. Because as far back as we look in the history of our planet, as far as we can tell, there has never been this much carbon, about 10 gigatons of carbon, going into the atmosphere per year. The closest analog that we have for current conditions, you have to go back more than 50,000 years. And at that time, it's estimated, it's hard to tell, of course, that long ago, but it's estimated that there was probably about a tenth of the carbon going into the atmosphere per year as there is today. So we are kicking our planet harder and faster than any time that we can see, even going back into the distant past. And so because of that, we are very concerned about how it's going to respond. And again, we can't put a specific amount or date on when, how fast the ocean circulation might slow down or even eventually shut down, um, how much methane will be released, not just from, from the permafrost, but from the continental shelf that underlies the Arctic Ocean. But we do know that again, the more carbon we produce and the faster we put it into the atmosphere, the greater the chance of these risks. And so that, again, just from the simple perspective of, of being pre, of precaution, of, of being risk averse, that is all the reason in the world why we should be cutting back our carbon emissions as soon as possible. And if people want more information, I actually served as the co-author on one of the most recent reviews of all the things that we know that we don't quite know that we wish we did. And people can find that online at science2017, 
www.globalchange.gov. And you're looking for chapter 15 there. Chapter 15 is the one that talks about potential surprises in the climate system. Okay. Uh, can I have that again? For the... Yes. That is science2017. So science2017.globalchange.gov. G-O-V. Got it. Um, can I just interject something on that, um, Catherine? Um, some people say from the science sort of point of view, well, it's not a science point of view, but from a historical point of view, that, okay, we've been as hot as these projections in our, his, you know, the history of the planet millions of years ago. But what uh, is what you're saying significantly different because the, the Earth got to those temperatures in much, 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 much slower processes. Uh, is that, would that be right? That is exactly what I'm saying. The earth has, has definitely been warmer than today, for sure. We know that. Yeah. But first of all, it didn't happen so quickly. But second of all, and even more importantly, there weren't humans around at that time. The reason why we care about a changing climate is not because the planet won't survive. The planet will survive. The question is, will human civilization <clears throat> survive? Because right. We have built two-thirds of the biggest cities in the world within about a meter of sea level. We've parceled out all of our arable land. We have allocated, and in many cases over-allocated, most of our water resources. We have almost 7.5 billion people and growing. We have never confronted any significant type of climate change in the history of human civilization on this planet. And today we're actually looking at an unprecedented rate of change, not just in terms of what we ourselves have experienced, but what the planet has seen as a whole, as far back as we can see. Of course, you know, there's always a possibility something was more extreme way back in the day. But again, that's irrelevant. We care about a changing climate because of us. Yes. Yeah, that's a very, very good point because you hear these points made, but but the way you're talking about it, we're talking about our survival, not the fact that not the planet's survival. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So um, moving on to speaking to you as a campaigner um, and in your setting in the, in the U S um, obviously the U S is a country we all look to as a very large emitter, but much more than that as uh, having the potential for global leadership. Um, so let, let's not talk about President Trump, uh, certainly not initially, uh, and step back to sort of more the wider picture on this. And um, can you see, Catherine, uh, uh, any way that that leadership and that bold action could be taken in the US without a, a kind of across um, party, across the aisle, cooperation between um, the two big parties? Ultimately, I think there will have to be bipartisan solutions. And so as a Canadian living in the US, I am resolutely bipartisan because a thermometer is not conservative or liberal. It doesn't give us a different answer depending on how we vote. So I view my role very much as providing information to anyone who wants it, regardless of their political affiliation, and then encouraging them to look for solutions that are consistent and compatible with their political ideology. But in order for solutions to endure, I think they will have to have bipartisan support, because as you know, the, if you look at the history of the presidency in the United States, it goes back and forth like a yo-yo every four to eight years from one party to the next. And then, of course, the House and the Senate go back and forth as well. So that's why I think we ultimately do need solutions that people, the majority of people can agree on. And that's why I'm so encouraged by the technological solutions, by the economic solutions that are already being implemented at the smaller scale in cities and states across the United States. So for example, here where I live in Texas, Texas actually has its own deregulated electricity grid. And because of that, they have been able to make much more substantial advances in wind and solar energy than some other states. And so as of the end of 2018, the ERCOT grid, as they call it, was up to 19.2% of its electricity for the entire year from wind and solar. And I know that where I live, they're actually already working on installing a few new solar farms um, in this part of the state. Uh, 
Oklahoma, I think, is an even greater percentage of their power from wind, all up the so-called red states in the middle of the country. Red, of course, in the United States being the conservative color, <laughs> which as yep. opposed to the liberal color, yes. Um, so, so all up the so-called red states, we are seeing tremendous transformations of the local economy to where people are understanding the benefits that clean energy brings to the local economy, to jobs, to small rural towns, which otherwise would have no way to employ the young people. We're starting to see these changes happen, but they're not yet happening at a sufficient rate to avoid the most serious danger and dangerous impacts of climate change. So that's where bipartisan policies come into place. And I'm very encouraged by the fact that in the United States, they have introduced a bipartisan bill to put a price on carbon. Um, that type of approach is one that I think has significant potential. We've already seen it um, being introduced and now applied in Canada. The Canadian province of British Columbia has had a price on carbon for the last 10 years. It has been very effective in reducing carbon and also in cutting personal and corporate income tax rates. But really, ultimately, as a, solution, as a scientist, I'm, I'm policy agnostic, as I like to say. I am for anything that works, anything that actually cuts carbon, and anything that the greatest percentage of the voting population can get behind. But again, I think that's why bipartisan solutions are important, because we need to be inclusive in order for these solutions to actually last. So what kind of solution actually can get uh, support from the centre-right? Well, many of them support a free market, but they don't understand that fossil fuels are actually significantly subsidized far in excess of the subsidies to clean energy. So significant traction, I think, can be gained by people like Bob Inglis, who runs an organization called Republic N, not Ann, but N in the US. And he advocates explicitly as a former Republican politician himself for free market solutions where you remove subsidies, where you level the playing field, where you, and then you put a price on carbon. Um, these type of approaches have actually got quite a bit of support from Bush era Republicans. Um, the Secretary of the Treasury and other leaders from the Bush era have publicly endorsed these types of approaches. So again, that makes me hopeful, not because I have a certain approach I prefer, but just because I like it when you see kind of unexpected sources endorsing and supporting the idea of reducing and eventually eliminating our carbon emissions. So are these kind of deep south um, Republicans with the kind of Bible Belt backing, or are they more the, the kind of elite liberal style? Well, probably it's the word, wrong word, but the more elite kind of Republican, say from the North East. They're, they're sort of the big business leader Republicans um, who see the big picture. Even many of the oil and gas companies have been operating with a shadow price on carbon for a long time. So if you talk to the people who kind of operate at the at the global or the large regional scale, and they understand uh, that energy is really what drives the economy, not, not locally, not regionally, but globally. And they also understand that China is certainly burning its share of coal, we all know that, but China is also leading the world in new clean energy installations, and that the United States already has fallen behind China and will soon fall behind India as well if it continues on its current pathway while India continues to grow. So, so the people who understand the global stage, who understand the United States' place in the global market, understand that clean energy is the future. Yeah, yeah. And on the, just on the politics of this, is your feeling that um, we kind of need to wait for the Trump storm to pass and then we can get on with it properly? Or it can even in Washington, can big progress be made? Well, I think the significant um, misperception that progress depends primarily on who leads the country. Under the Obama administration, the, the administration, especially in its second term, not so much in the first, but more in the second term, it did make um, climate change a priority and it introduced the Clean Power Plan as a regulatory solution. But if, if you asked me what were the greatest successes, what encourages you the most, what, where, where, was, where was the most progress made during the entire eight years of the Obama administration, my answer to you would be not in Washington. My answer would be in what cities are doing. There's an incredible number of cities that are going carbon free across the US, including right here in Texas. There's incredible growth in the solar and wind energy industry to the point where for the last five years in the United States, according to the Bureau of Labor, the top fastest growing job has either been in wind or solar. 
Um, the fact that there's more jobs in the solar energy industry now than there is in power generation from fossil fuels across the whole country. I mean, this is where I saw most of the movement. I would say, you know, this is just my own estimate, but I would estimate about 80% of the forward momentum was made below the federal level under the Obama administration. And so mm. for that reason, it's a mistake to say that there is not any forward momentum anymore because of the Trump administration, even though he is certainly doing his best to make sure that is the case. Yeah, yeah. So the organization I'm allied to, the Citizens Climate Lobby, um, with the carbon price, uh, we, we call it fee, um, now, if that is implemented widely, and then of course the the money gained is dividended back to the population, so um, it's not like uh, the government's taking your money away. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if that was implemented very robustly with a kind of quite highly uh, steeply rising cost year by year um, of of carbon, then all these things happening at a lower level would just be boosted rather than. Um, overridden it was just extra implement uh, extra incentive for all those sort of small initiatives to be um, added together and combined and uh, everyone in the whole economy is trying to work at decarbonizing mm-hmm. that's exactly the case so rather than being prescriptive trying to pick winners and losers in the technology arena trying to impose regulatory solutions where people can or cannot do something People could still, you know, people can still drive a gas guzzler if they want to, but they have to pay the price. Whereas yeah. uh, if you want to put solar panels on your home, like we're actually doing today, then you are even more incentivized than you are right now to do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're a Canadian and Canada's just done a, a whole countrywide, um, not exactly reproduction of the British Columbia policy, but mm-hmm. um, the same sort of thing. So do you think that will have a bigger impact than just the kind of the headline would suggest? Well, it really depends, um, first of all, on what happens to the price over time, obviously, Uh, because if you have, you know, you start off small and the idea is you start off small to kind of introduce the price signals, but to really get the effective reductions, you have to continue to ratchet that up. And then, of course, it also depends on what are done with the revenues. And that, of course, is the key debate anywhere from Washington State, where they've actually turned down a price on carbon twice because they were fighting over what would happen to the revenues, um, to the differences between how it's implemented in British Columbia, how it's implemented across all of Canada, and the current bill that is being considered um, in the United States today. Mm, Yeah, yeah. And, and, And that's a very important issue because, as many people have pointed out, Uh, people who are lower down the socioeconomic spectrum are the ones who actually disproportionately pay more of their income towards a carbon tax because they are a price on carbon because they, they spend more of their income on things, basic things like gas and groceries. Whereas people who have more disposable income have a bit more choice as to how they, they spend that. So there does have to be consideration of the socioeconomic inequities that are already built into the system to make sure that those who least contribute to the problem, frankly, are not the ones who bear the, great, the greatest part of the price or cost. Yeah. I thought the studies have shown that if you just dividend the money back equally to the citizens, the poorest um, actually get more back than their prices increase. Mm-hmm. Well, again, equally is a relative term. Do you do it in proportion to their income? I mean, that, that's, a, that's what really has to be considered most carefully. And people are aware of that and they are considering that, I think. Yeah, great. Um, Andrew, we need to sort of bring you more in. Right. Uh, and I think, can we move on to speaking to Catherine as a Christian in all of this um, uh, campaign work, particularly with the evangelical, her, her fellow evangelicals um, in Texas and, and beyond? Um, do you have a question, Andrew? Well, I, yeah, I suppose there's a, a stack of questions. Actually, just before that question, though, into that area, related slightly to what you're saying, um, with campaigning, um, Catherine, it, 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 uh, it, <clears throat> I've just crossed my mind, although it hasn't, I had thought about this before, but, but the way that humans work, often money talks, even if, if you can't grab them for the concern and the passion of the environment, if there are certain things that can be in place that actually people think, oh, gosh, if... Um, if if we do this it, more money comes their way for something and it actually supports the environment are there any sort of things that 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 can look like that i mean you may have touched into it already but <clears throat> in the sense that companies would say they'll be thinking selfishly about money but because it happens to also support the cause it'll actually push support if you see what i mean yeah 
Oh, um, yes. And, and there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that at all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with being good stewards of our finances at the same time. And so often we hear stories, for example, of um, I have I have somebody I know who has a master's in divinity, but decided that the best thing that he could do would be to develop an energy auditing company for churches and seminaries and Christian colleges. So he goes into these often large facilities and he does an energy audit to show them where they are heating or cooling or using energy inefficiently, Mm. how much money they can save by doing the upgrades, which of course also reduce the carbon footprint. And for many of those churches, you know, the money that they can save is the primary incentive, but does that make their carbon reductions any less real or effective? Absolutely not. And in Mm. fact, I think it often Mm. inspires people in the congregation to do the same. Um, then I, I've, I've definitely heard stories, for example, of cities where they decided, well, you know, we really want to attract more young people to the downtown core. So in addition to parks and walkable cities, we should probably lead certify some of our buildings because it would look good to have lead certified buildings. And that's, mm-hmm. of course, the standard um, for buildings where you have a certain amount of energy conservation, a certain amount of mm-hmm. passive energy uh, technology. So, so they, they lead certified some of their buildings and then they found out they saved so much money that mm-hmm. they went ahead and they, they, went, they moved up to the next lead certification level and they did more buildings. There is nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's fantastic because it makes them even more genuine and enthusiastic ambassadors than they would have been in the first place. Yeah, I, 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 the reason I thought that is I work in education and part of one of my roles is to cut down the use of paper. It's ridiculous where we are. And I, I realize that you're up against a whole system where I'm working and it tallies in that actually what's starting to work is not so much saying, talk about what about ecology, what about saving paper and recycling? It doesn't seem to work, but what does work is when you put figures with the finance guy that I work with to, in front of the governors to say, look, you'll be saving this. And oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. In that case, then we should make moves. Now, of course, then it happens to be ec- ecological as well, but that's the kind of point I'm saying you, that human nature does tend to be governed by money rather than passion in many cases. Um, well, and, and the thing is, is we've gotten to the point now in 2019 <laughs> where our decisions can be cost effective. Back yeah. 20, 30 years ago, often yeah. it wouldn't necessarily save money. You'd be doing it yeah. to, quote, save the planet. Yeah. But again, we're not doing it to save the planet. We're doing it you know, to save ourselves um, in the future. But we can also do it to save ourselves money in the, in the present. Yeah. And that really is why clean energy is thriving across Texas is because uh, wind and solar energy now, especially at certain times of the year, yeah. it's not just cheaper than coal. It's actually cheaper than natural gas. And again, natural mm-hmm. gas comes from Texas. So yeah. it's pretty amazing that you can see this this type of change happening in, in very unexpected places. Yeah, mm-hmm. Texas, the light, the guiding light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Little so, did you know. <laughs> yeah, so moving on then to the religious side then, um, Ed, as you were saying. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, um, I would say that, um, uh, um, that uh, from my background, my, my particular teenage fundamentalist Christian background, um, say back in the early 80s, uh, I definitely came under the assumption, this is before the, the real worries and concerns of climate change, but that the world was something to be saved out of in that form of Christianity, and the rapture was quite a big thing. I think I must have got caught up in almost an American form of Christianity, but over here. Mm, it <laughs> yeah. sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah because I've, I've talked to Americans, and I have much more in-tuned uh, discussions than I would with Ed on this. Yeah. Uh, it's like Ed's like, no, I, I didn't. <laughs> you know, well, so, you, know, um, <laughs> you know what? So, so um, I grew up in, in the Brethren Church, which originally actually originated in Tunbridge, Tunbridge Wells in the UK. Yes, that's right. And, and so most of the Brethren Assemblies are through Canada and the UK and Europe, but there are a few in the US. And so occasionally when I was in high school, we would go to youth conferences in the States. And you're absolutely right. The culture was very different. I mean, that is where you would get the books talking about how if you played the music backwards, it would have satanic messages. Oh, I had all that. That's me. <laughs> Yes, absolutely me. We, we would know. get that when we went to the US. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so I realized a lot later that I was infected, or my parents were from American mm-hmm. former Christianity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we had those discussions in the church, and they actually had visitors come, played record backwards, and got all this backward masking stuff that didn't mm-hmm. actually amount to much. Yes. Um, we did it on a Keith Green record once, if you know who Keith Green is. I do, I do. Yes, I know. And so we did it on a Keith Green message, and it sounded like someone just said, I worship the devil and Satan. Oh. <laughs> he, never, he never said that, but once you put it in your mind, you kind of heard it. 
And um, <laughs> it was like, um, it, it was somebody was doing it to just debunk this because you say, look, you know. But anyway, that's that's aggression. But yes, that background. Too funny, too funny. <laughs> it's so great to meet. It's always American or Canadian people that I have more in tune with on this. And Ed is like, what, what, what? what? Where were you? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, so, and so because of that, you know, and this was actually more in the 70s. I mean, I remember my parents had all these books when I was growing up. There was the whole Hal Lindsey, the whole Left Behind, the whole idea that by adding up various numbers in the Bible, you could figure out when the world was going to end. Yeah. My, my husband remembers being told by his youth group pastor that, uh, that the world was ending, that Christ was returning that night. And so we had a special meeting of all the kids in the church um, and, and people were crying and praying and panicking. And my husband yeah. remembers that his mother pulled him aside before he went. And his mother said, just so you know, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had the rounds of the Thief in the Night movies, um, uh, if you're familiar with those, where you'd have all the young people frightened out of their lives that, you know, you'd go back home and no one was there and you missed out on the rapture and this apocalyptic kind of tribulation that would follow. Yes. But, yeah. but actually, this does link into what we're talking about. It um, does. It yeah. does, because my parents uh, now are still very, um, they're kind of very skeptical on global warming, but they, they, they kind of flip between the idea that it's not going to happen and it's not real, or it's assumed into this apocalyptic future. So it's like, aha, so the roaring of the waves in Matthew 24 you know, it, it, this must be global warming, you know, part of the projection. And so basically it's almost fate and therefore it's this sinking ship. It's all happening. And maybe this is the sign of the end. So you actually celebrate Jesus coming on, mm -hmm. on the waves of global waves, warming yeah. waves. <laughs> yes. So um, that's, so what I wanted to put to you was the, um, this, these concepts between at least at first, anyway, the apocalyptic form of subsuming it within to theology, which makes you not care because I had no future care for the planet because it was like a new one was coming. And matter of fact, global warming may be the way to cleanse it, you know, <laughs> ready for the new one, you know? Um, yes, yes. So, yeah. So what would be your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, just to digress a little bit, it's very interesting because that perspective, that theological perspective competes directly with the reform perspective that Christians are to help to redeem the earth. And so there have been, it's been several decades now of, of a long tradition of writing and speaking and publishing in the Reformed Church on the idea of creation care, so caring for creation. And that really provides the foundation of the discussion that we have across the global church today. But it, it falls a bit short in that, first of all, it assumes a very specific theological approach that not everybody's on board with. But also, by using the word creation care, it again applies a divide between humans and nature. Whereas, of course, we are all part of creation. And um, in Genesis 1, it says that God gave us responsibility over every living thing on this planet. That doesn't just mean, you know, the plants and animals. It means our brothers and sisters as well, because as far as I know, most of them are living beings too. So, uh, so, so that, that it's, it's, I don't think it's an accident that the creation care message didn't really take root um, in denominations and in parts of Christianity that didn't really feel that the earth was going to endure for a very long time and we should redeem it. But when, when I speak to people, and that's definitely the tradition I grew up in myself, although it was not quite as apocalyptic as, you know, show up for youth group tonight and this is the last night of your life. I right. <laughs> never got that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the response to that, I think, has to come theologically rather than scientifically. And the fascinating thing, of course, is that humans 2,000 years ago were exactly the same as us. They thought the same things and they did the same things. And so back in Thessalonica, there were people in the church who were saying, well, you know, Christ could return any day. So yeah. we are just going to quit our jobs. We yeah. are just going to sit around. We are going to depend on everybody else to supply our needs because the world is ending soon. So why should we do anything? And the Apostle Paul wrote to them in his inimitable way. And he said, get a job, <laughs> support your family, care for the widows and the orphans and the poor. Um, just because you don't know the day or the time is no excuse to not do what we're supposed to do here, which is to love others as we've been loved. It's not very loving to people to sit back in your lazy boy or armchair and kick up your feet and say, bring me some food. Mm. The loving thing to do is to go out and serve others because we don't know, we certainly don't know when our own lives will end, let alone this planet. And because of that, we are just called to live day to day um, serving God as best we can. So that often is a, um, I think, a, a 
a reality, a theological reality check for people that God really does call us to be light in this world, to care for others, to love others as we ourselves have been loved, to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's just, if you start looking for those types of admonitions throughout the New Testament, you can't hardly read more than a few chapters without running into something about that. It really is one of the major messages in the Bible to us today, that we are to uh, live a life that looks out for the welfare of others. And that connects directly to climate change, because who is being most affected by a changing climate those who are already most vulnerable, those who are poor and hungry and disadvantaged and suffering from diseases and lack of access to clean water and civil unrest and refugee crises. These are the people who are suffering first and foremost from a changing climate. And so if we really believe what the Bible says, if we take it seriously, we will be out at the front of the line demanding action on climate for their sakes. Right. And do you find that in the Bible sort of belt and the Texas belt that this subsuming it into a, an apocalyptic end and escaping from the world, uh, the common one, or is it actually more the denial uh, one from Christians? Well, um, it really varies. But what every argument I've heard has in common is it's all a smokescreen. Right. It is a convenient excuse. It could be a religiously sounding excuse. It could be a moral sounding excuse like, oh, those poor people in Africa need fossil fuels. Well, most countries don't have fossil fuels. So what, you're going to sell it to them and put them further in debt to you? Yeah. Um, or it could be sciencey sounding smoke screens like it's just a natural cycle or you scientists mm -hmm. aren't sure about this. So you're just mm -hmm. making it up to fund your grant money. Mm -hmm. But if you have a conversation that goes any more than about 30 to 60 seconds with anybody who says one of these things, the conversation will take an abrupt right turn on their own initiative into, I don't want the government telling me what to do. I don't want the government ruining the economy. What's wrong with fossil fuels? We've used them all our lives and they've been great. I like my life the way it is. I don't want to give up my truck. So the real issue is solution aversion. So while we absolutely have to address the smoke screens, and that's what I do in my little online video series called Global Weirding. Each short five-minute episode addresses one of the smoke screens. Yeah. But we need to focus the discussion on solutions because that is the real problem that 99.9% .9 of the people have with the reality that climate is changing, humans are responsible, and we need to fix it. What I'm not, I uh, haven't quite heard yet is the issue of uh, science denial. And uh, there seems to be quite an overlap between people who are young earth creationists and uh, are quite resistant to normal kind of mainstream evolution uh, and people who deny the climate science. Uh, um, is that, uh, am I speaking accurately? There is a strong correlation between a political identity and rejection of science that appears to challenge that political identity. Um, so they've done studies looking at various issues, and if there is some type of politicization to them or some type of identity issue to them, then that's where you start to see the rejection of the science. But in, in the case of, of climate change, I mean, understanding the fact that climate is changing due to human activities requires nothing more than basic radiative transfer that we've understood since the 1850s. In fact, it's the same physics that explains how our stoves and our fridges work. And the, the same people who say that climate can't be changing or the science isn't real, they don't say that their stoves and their fridges aren't real. So, so that kind of shows us it isn't really rejection of the science. It's rejection of the implications of the science because it is a lot easier to say, oh, that science isn't real than to say it's real, but I don't want to deal with it. That's very, very interesting. Actually, I could probably ask you something quite um, pointed here, Catherine, about this because, because that's exactly how from certainly my point of view and background and where I am now regarding evolution as an example, because that's mm -hmm. exactly how a young earth creationist would approach evolutionary science. Mm -hmm. It's not an acceptance. Uh, it's a rejection of the implications of biology because Precise. of the Genesis reading. That really is the issue, not yeah. the science itself. And so I'm going to assume that you are accepting of evolution because it would be very interesting if you weren't um, because it would be, um, the same principle that you talked about at work, probably. Um, exactly. So. It would. It would. Well, so I, I had um, 
what I didn't realize was such an unusual upbringing at the time. My father was not only a um, teaching elder in our church, uh, but he was also a science teacher. And so I grew up with the idea that if you, if you believe that God created this universe that we live in, then what is science other than studying how God did it in the first right. place? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I grew up with this idea that science and the Bible cannot possibly be in conflict, but if they appear to be in conflict, as they absolutely do, in that case, we just don't understand or we're mis- misinterpreting or too narrowly interpreting <sighs> an aspect of the Bible or our science or perhaps both. And so with some patience and humility, sometimes it's possible to work it out. Sometimes we'll never know in our lifetime. But if you start with the fundamental premise that they cannot be in conflict, it's a lot easier to address many of these issues than, unfortunately, the premise that many people in the United States start with today, which is the premise that they are in conflict. In, mm. Until I moved to the U.S., I had never met somebody who didn't think that the world was, you know, was old. I had never met a young earth creationist until I moved to the U.S. <laughs> and I, I still remember being absolutely shocked because my undergraduate degree was in astrophysics. I thought, well, you know, so you believe God created galaxies with light coming from those galaxies that was redshifted to appear that those galaxies are, you right. know, a certain number of billion years away, but he made, yeah. he tricked us. It was just really um, very difficult for me to understand. And then my own background is not in biology. I'm not an expert in any way, shape or form in uh, evolution or evolutionary biology, but I am an expert in the type of arguments that people use to deny, reject, and deceive us about the science. Arguments like cherry picking the evidence or appeal to false experts or logical fallacies or misrepresentations like it's cold outside, so therefore the entire planet can't be warming over climate timescales. So interestingly, my familiarity with these techniques, these rhetorical techniques that people use to try to muddy the waters on climate science It was fascinating because when I took that expertise and I went back and I looked at the arguments people used to reject evolution, they were using the same ones. The same ones. And and I thought to myself, if you if you have a logical leg to stand on, you would not be using rhetorical techniques that are explicitly designed to deceive your audience. Yeah, and I mean, I noticed straight away when you were talking because I'm I'm very familiar with young earth creationism and the ideas of rejecting biology and and. It sounded very similar. But does this mean then that young earth creations, creationists, in your view, are actually consistent in the sense that they then follow through with denying climate change and uh-huh. evolution? Yes. Uh, no, it's a totally different issue because here's the thing. To agree that humans are changing climate, we don't have to agree that the planet is any more than 300 years old, give or take right. you know, a decade or two. And as far as I know, I have never met anybody who would argue that the planet is not at least 300 years old. So, so there is plenty of room for young earth creationists, for people who think that our, you know, the origins of life or even the universe are young to get on board with the idea that climate is changing. In fact, my husband, when we were writing our book together, my husband said, do you have a, a, a plot, a figure showing carbon dioxide levels and temperature going back 6,000 years? So I said, well, no, I don't because there's no scientific reason to have that. And he just looked at me and I was like, oh, there is good reason to make that type of figure because why show any older data? And so I, we made a plot of the last 6,000 years and it is stunning because there is nothing happening, climatically speaking, except a very, very tiny, gradual, slow cooling because according to natural cycles, we should be heading into the next ice age sometime in the next 1500 years, Mm. a very gradual slow cooling until the beginning of the industrial revolution when all of a sudden our temperature and our CO2 levels, you know, shoot up almost vertically on the scale. And, And so I actually find that figure to be extremely powerful because not only does it use the same time frame that people are comfortable with from a younger perspective, Mm. but it is also approximately the time frame of human civilization on this planet. And to circle back to the initial part of our discussion, why do we care about a changing climate? It's because it affects us. Our human civilization is not yeah. built to withstand these changes. But there might have been a blip at Noah's Ark on your 6,000-year-old yeah. timeline. Mm, no, that didn't affect CO2 levels. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, Ken Ham argues that there was a mini ice age after the floods in order for the continents to have ice bridges for the animals to get across. I've heard him say it. It's oh, well, there, there's no data for that at all. No, I know. Of course not. <laughs> They're making stuff up. Yeah, it's just, um, <laughs> this is interesting <laughs> to me. That's a kinder thing that I would have said. Yeah. <laughs> this is interesting to me. Uh, Andrew and I uh, run this discussion group in, um, in London 
and so and it, it isn't particularly bipartisan in terms of sort of all Christians arguing one way and atheists the other but um, obviously there's always the potential for that and uh, the way that um, you take up a position in a sort of tribal identity way that you were referring to Catherine is it seems to be an, could be an issue there as well um, it absolutely is. And that's why when we have these conversations, it is absolutely essential to begin the conversation, not from what most divides us, but rather from what most unites us. That is where we have to begin the conversation if it is be, to be constructive. So if we don't know what unites us, what we have in common, then we need to get to know each other better and figure out, you know, it might be something as simple as we are both birders. Or we care very much about the future of our community, or we care about the economy, or uh, whatever it is. That's where the conversation has to start. And so uh, that's why I have spent so much of my time, not, not uniquely, but I spend about a third of my outreach talking to people in my faith community, um, specifically uh, Christians, more often than not Protestants, because those are the ones who I most identify with, because I can begin that conversation with their shared values. So... Um, Back in November 2017, I had the honor of giving the John Stott Memorial Lecture in London. At oh, John Stott's wow. Lecture. Yes, yes. That's cool. So, so John Stott, for those of you who don't know him, I'm sure you do. You um, he, yes, he is essentially the theological successor to uh, C.S. Lewis. And yeah. um, he was a very well respected throughout the Christian church around the world, um, a leading theologian, um, a very humble man, um, somebody who has left a tremendous positive legacy, I think, behind. And he, there is a, a John Stott Memorial Lecture now in his actual church in London, and I was invited to give it in November 2017, which was the most tremendous honor. And uh, because of who he was, because of what he had meant to me personally, as well as to you know probably millions around the world, because of his, his own focus very much on the love and the goodness of God, I was able to really start that conversation with people in his church from the values that we share, from the idea that we accept the responsibility that he has given to love and care for others. We're actually motivated from our hearts to care and love for others. It's not a duty that we wish that we could shirk. It's actually something that we are designed to do. And the depth of that conversation, I think, was really remarkable. Um, but if, if somebody doesn't share those values, they may say, well, how am I supposed to talk to people? We're, we're all humans. We all have values. We have loves. We have passions. We have fears. We have things that make us tick. We just need to get to know each other and figure out what those points of connection can be. And in some cases, you know, there might be a few people where we genuinely can't find that point of connection. In that case, it's better off for them to have a conversation with somebody else. But many times we can find something. In some cases, for me, that point of connection has been something as trivial as knitting. <laughs> and and the conversation has gone from knitting to a sustainable lifestyle to um, consumerism to our carbon footprint with somebody who was not even on board with the idea that humans are changing climate. And that yeah. was actually a conversation I had in the UK. Wow. Wow. Yeah. John Stott yeah. connection. Yeah. <laughs> he was, um, when I was young, yeah. when I was young, he was John. Um, we used to say orthodoxy, anything that's in line with John Stott. <laughs> <And so, laughs> There you go. John Stott is almost like the lowest common denominator that's for right. Christians. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I love this point about kind of reaching out with values um, to people. So um, what are the, the key, the, the kind of values that we have as, as atheists are all about harm and benefit and that kind of thing. But th there are other values that particularly that Christians can have on um, come out with sort of like purity and that sort of thing that we, we kind of recoil, recoil a bit from. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the most interesting conversations that I've had is with one of my colleagues who we were at a conference together and he said, you know, I really like to sit down and talk with you and have a chat. And we weren't working together on any projects at the time. So I didn't know what he wanted to talk about, but I said, sure, I would love to talk with you. So we sat down and he just, and as soon as we sat down, he just leaned across the table to me and said, you know, I'm a humanist, but I care about people too. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, of course you do. And he said, well, that, that's why I do what I do, because I know that the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world are being affected, and that's not fair, but they need energy. So that's why I'm studying what type of energy they could have that would help them you know, increase their quality of life while, while not contributing to you know, the global carbon budget. So really, I mean, 
it, when we start to put these limits on what we care about, I think that's where we run into trouble because then we're reinforcing the idea that it is an identity issue that, you know, th if I'm this type of person, you know, if I'm a liberal tree hugger, then I care about it. But if I'm not, then I don't. If I'm somebody who cares about the economy, well, then I don't care about climate change. You have to care about, you know, seals more than the economy to care about climate change. Or, you know, the yeah. whole, if I'm an atheist, I think this, if I'm a humanist, I think that. The reality is, the bottom line is we're humans. We live on this planet. Um, there is the occasional person who does not care at all for the welfare of their fellow brothers and sisters, but most of us recognize um, concepts like fairness and injustice and poverty and, and the need to, to do what we can with the resources we have to help those who don't have them. Um, mm. there, there's so, so many points of connection that we can make, and uh, for many of us, the point of connection is our faith, um, but for many of us, it isn't. Isn't it um, interesting, though, that you can actually get because of an atheist or agnostic who might think there's no afterlife or anything future, you, you would you would naturally think that you would care for this life and your children and the planet. And it's ironic that you have, you know, groups of faith people. And it's because of their understanding of their faith and revelation of the Bible in a certain way that actually stops them being as caring as the as that kind of atheist and agnostic person <laughs> because of faith issues. That's really bizarre. Well, I, um, I think it's I think it's a travesty. I mean, if you actually look at what the Bible says, it doesn't say that at all. And so, yeah. some of my my favorite groups are the faith based groups, like Arasha, which is a conservation organization based in the UK, but it works around the world. Where it works uh, restoring uh, ecosystems, it works with marginalized people, and they do it all from a very inclusive but a firmly faith based perspective. I mean. Again, if, if you take the Bible seriously, if you actually read what it says and, tr and take it seriously, then we should be at the front of the line demanding action on this. And sadly, the reason why Christians are not is because today, too many Christians, their statement of faith is being written by their politics, by their political identity, which frankly mm -hmm. is informed by selfishness, fear, and greed. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're, we're beginning to wind up. and. Yeah. Um, I'm disappointed we haven't mentioned your TikTok uh, yet. So um, Andrew and I have listened to it and we were really impressed. Mm, thank you. Um, <clears throat> could you say a little bit about what we'll get if, if we, you know, if people tap in and, and hear it, uh, yes. having, having heard this? So, so please do watch my TED Talk. It just came out in mid-December 2018, so just before the end of the year. And if you watch the TED Talk, there's quite a few other good ones that follow immediately on it, so you might get a little bit addicted if you start. Yes. Um, but for, for, for my talk, um, I decided to answer the most frequent question I get, which is, what am I supposed to do about this problem? Because it's a huge global problem. It's caused by every single one of us almost around the world. It's been going on for multiple centuries. So the biggest question we have is, sure, I hear we're supposed to fix it, but how, how are we supposed to fix it? What am I supposed to do? I'm just one person. And so I answer that question in my TED Talk, and the answer I think surprises many people. The first and most important thing that we can do about climate change is talk about it, which is exactly what we are doing right now. Surveys have shown in the US that less than three, quarter, three quarters of the population um, doesn't even hear somebody else talk about it more than once or twice a year. And here's the connection. If we don't talk about it, why would we care? If we don't care, why would we do anything? If we don't do anything, why would we ask for action? This, the scale of the action that we need at the region, local, regional, national and international level to fix this problem. The solutions begin with talking about it because if we don't talk about it, we're never going to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So de definitely I'll do um, a link for that talk in the show notes. Um, and just picking up on that, I think for our kind of community, often um, when you, we eat together and everything whether you're a vegetarian or not uh, mm -hmm. comes up a lot and that, that's an easy way in mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot that making personal choices to reduce our carbon footprint is important because first of all we're walking the walk but second of all it actually gives us something positive to talk about as well right yeah yeah and I'd just like to give a little rider before we end, actually, because something um, is quite interesting you mentioned in your talk about the frame of mind you can be in, like someone was in a cold environment, someone was in a hot environment, and they thought differently about global warming question. Is that, That's right. You said something like that, didn't you? Oh, um, yes. Oh, you know what? I think you might have be referring to my TEDx talk that I did at Texas Tech uh, two or three years ago. Ah, 
Right. Ah, yes. So, they, so, so yes. So I probably I've, rolled onto that then. Yes. <laughs> it could have. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a TED talk that was done in December 2018 that talks about um, what's the most important thing we can do about climate change. Yeah. But then the TEDx talk I did a few years previously uh, asked the question, what if climate change is real? And so it goes through the idea of, well, how do we even know it's real? How are we subconsciously affected by our environment, which is not just our political ideology, but even the simple fact that if you put two groups of people in two different rooms and one's warmer and one's cooler, the people in the cooler room are less likely to think global warming is real, even though they, they're aware that they're in a cooler room. So um, that talk is very different. It goes through some of those things. And so if, if people have the time, I would encourage you to watch both. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just going to make the point that um, I remember uh, falsely, and this would be very interesting for you, Ed, to hear, but I remember back in the day um, watching the, um, what was the famous one? the political guy or oh, what's his name he did um oh um, um al gore al gore now watching that i came out like so depressed and so down and so like oh what's the point it's like helpless future it's apocalyptic almost and then yes. i watched this channel four program which is not good i know it's been sort of pulled to pieces but it was a sort of one i don't know you must have seen it ed one that was really countering that i know of it yeah and i felt the next day it changed my home and for all the wrong reasons probably but it was because it had a positive message you know, saying you're not to worry because of this and it brought out all these problems with the other documentary and i was walking on cloud nine and now i realize probably in a false sense but i think what it was was the was was it was it was trying to give you some hope out of the despair, even if it was for the wrong reasons. So I think hearing people like you, Catherine, who see the problem, but you don't come away from listening to you thinking, oh, gosh, that's, that's it then. You know, <laughs> there's no hope. <laughs> you have a hopeful yeah. disposition. So, Well, I, I completely agree. In fact, if you ask me what's the number one thing we're lacking today, I would say hope. Because without yeah. hope, we are not going to succeed. In order to have hope, we need a positive vision of the future instead of an apocalyptic one. Yes. And if we don't talk about it, if we don't talk about, frankly, the amazing things that are happening around the world, we aren't going to understand that there could even be hope. And so that really is central. And I agree. I mean, the science is depressing. It just makes you want to pull the blanket over your head. Yes, and, that's what and, I felt. And make yeah. it go away. That yeah. is not how we're going to fix this problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I went to a talk with um, Lord Stern and that's those sort of people there. And what came out was that um, if we did embrace all industry and all technologies to uh, decarbonize, the actual total cost to the economy would only be about um, 1% or something like that. So mm -hmm. prices would, would go up 1% overall to deliver what we have already, but in a carbon-free way, yeah. which was astoundingly small. Yes, Crazy. I completely agree. I mean, it's ridiculous. Even for the United States, taking the most conservative estimate of the impacts, um, it would be between a five to 20 year return period on the investment required to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement for the United States um, to when they would start saving money because of the avoided impacts at the very, very most. I mean, by any form of financial return and any common sense economic argument, we should be acting. And the, re the main reason why we aren't, um, in my opinion, is because, first of all, the majority of the power and wealth in this world is concentrated in the hands of people, organizations, and companies who achieve that wealth through the use or encouraging the use of fossil fuels, number one. You just have to look at the Wikipedia list of the richest companies in the world, and it's very, very clear who has the money and why. And then the second reason is, is because their message of delaying actually dovetails with our human psychology. The world is changing very quickly and that's a scary thing. And so we know that fossil fuels have served us well over the past 300 years. They've brought us tremendous benefits. I am genuinely grateful for what fossil fuels have brought me. And I know that my life would be much shorter and much more miserable today if it were not for the advances of the industrial revolution powered by fossil fuels. And so we are naturally worried, and I don't think it's too strong to say many people are scared of the rapid pace of change that we're experiencing. And so the messages of, oh, it's okay, no, that new spangled stuff is too expensive, no, those scientists are making it up, those messages fall on fertile ground because we really are afraid of what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I will throw in the show notes a link to your talk the Bible does talk about climate change, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was brilliant as well. Uh, oh, and that says what it does, what it says on the tin. And um, I think we can guess what the answer is. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and then the two TED Talks as well, I think would probably be useful to people. Yeah. Okay. I'll get I, Andrew um, to help me on the TEDx talk. I will indeed. I'm, I know what the future holds for me because it's like 12 o'clock over here, so it will be sleep. Yeah. Before long. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. My, my future holds dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, thank that you was, so much. A, a, one of the most enjoyable talks I've ever had, I think. Oh, yeah. well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I had a great time talking with you too. Yes, it's been terrific. Um, and I'll send you um, uh, the, some links of other stuff that I found to get your comments on for future stuff, um, Catherine. So that'll be yes, yeah. that'll be good. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you.